Before I introduce our lovely speaker, I just wanted to say hello. I'm Seth. I'm going to be one of the, uh, I guess, co hosts of, uh, of HDO's virtual Congress this weekend. So you will be seeing my face from time to time. I'm not just a random person popping in and out. Um, and so I'm excited to be here and to help out. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker of track two, day one of, virtual, of the virtual Congress. So we have Dr. Emma Wynell. Did I pronounce that right? Perfect. Sweet. Awesome. Off to a good start. From uh, from Cardiff University, uh, which is located in the UK. And she'll be talking about staying healthy with HD um, and the possibility of HD being in your life. She's also a TEDx speaker whose favorite place to visit prior to COVID was Sri Lanka. I haven't been. Heard great things. And so during this 30 minutes... She'll be speaking for about 20 minutes and then followed by a Q&A for the last 10 minutes. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to enter it into the chat or use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to, to uh, ask the question. We'll do our best to answer all of them, but worst case scenario is we'll, we'll figure out another way to answer it if we run out of time. And without further ado, the floor is yours. So take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Seth. So I'm going to share my screen, the infamous sharing of screens now, right? Um, thank you for that little intro. That was really nice. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I would say good afternoon because it's afternoon for me, but we've got people from all over the world, which is awesome. So wherever you are in the world, um, nice to virtually meet you. Um, as you heard, I'm in Cardiff in Wales. And I was just saying before, we, we did have a thunderstorm, so, but now it's looking sunny outside, so who knows um, what the weather is like. But it's an absolute pleasure to be able to join you today uh, to talk a little bit about brain training. And brain training is something that I worked on as a scientist and a researcher, um, both in the laboratory and in the clinic as well. And today I'm going to share with you some of the results that I found, um, and then I want to kind of answer as many questions um, as possible. So there is a little bit of interactivity in the talk um, and I'll let you know um, when that is. So um, let's kick off by going back in time. Um, so this is a picture of my PhD thesis. So when I started my PhD, um, my PhD was looking at mouse models of Huntington's disease and whether this mouse model accurately represented the condition um, in people. So this was my thesis. Um, this is meant to be a picture of me in the lab, um, taken, I think it was on International Women's Day. Um, I know it looks like a sciencey photo, but I'm just staring at a conical flask of Ribena. Um, so don't believe all the sciencey photos that you see. Um, but really the slide is about the main um, kind of data that I got from my PhD was looking at how brain training or cognitive training used in mouse models of Huntington's disease might be beneficial. So it took me about three years, um, but at the end of my PhD, I published this um, paper, which showed that when we gave mice with HD um, brain training, it would um, improve their performance on the task and it did have some um, impacts upon their movement as well. So when I talk about brain training, and particularly the stuff that I did um, in the lab, lots of people quite rightly um, and understandably ask, how do you do brain training with mice? And that is a really um, important and relevant question here. So this is what we call a nine hole box. Uh, and it's the main piece of apparatus that I used in my studies. So you should be able to see these nine holes um, at the back of the box here. Um, this bit at the front, there's just like a little panel um, which can be filled with food or liquid reward. And really this is a bit of a modified version of something called the Skinner box that has levers for animals to press. This is similar, but the mice are trained to poke their nose into these holes uh, in response to them lighting up. So I spent a long time um, doing this just to give you a little bit of a, 
um, a flavor of what it kind of looks like in real life. This is those nine holes um, that I mentioned to you and five of them can light up. So this is a task that we used in the mice. It's a reaction time task. So what happens is one of those lights shines and then the mouse is trained to go and poke its nose um, into the hole. So it's a little bit like some of those tasks that you might get at like fun fairs. Um, I think they're called Batak light boards where you know you bash the, the um, buttons when they light up. It's a little bit like that, but the mouse um, equivalent. So this is what happens. Um, the mice are trained to kind of scan all of these lights and then randomly one light will come on. And then the mouse goes over pokes its nose in the hole, and for correctly doing so, gets rewarded. Um, in this case, strawberry milkshake. Um, and then, so the animals learn that by poking their nose in the hole, they get reward. And you can speed up the um, how quick those lights come on to really challenge the mice to get there quickly and how attentive they are. So how quickly they get there um, and how accurate they are as well. So just another little demo. Um, the mouse goes over, pokes its nose in the hole and gets some nice strawberry milkshake um, for doing so. So at the end of my PhD, um, we had this data which demonstrated that brain training was useful in mouse models of Huntington's. So then I really wanted to take these data and take them into the clinic and work with people and families uh, impacted by HD to see whether this might be kind of viable or feasible um, with, with people. So at the time, nobody had really looked at brain training computer games in HD. Um, I was at the end of my PhD, I wasn't earning a salary, so I managed to convince some funders to pay for a study. Um, it was a three year study that looked at um, whether brain training was feasible in HD. So this study was born and it was called COGTRAIN HD. Um, all of these studies have catchy or less catchy acronym titles, don't they? But COGTRAIN HD was a feasibility study. So because nobody had done brain training before, we wanted to check that it was feasible, that it could actually um, work. So this was a study that was designed to be based in people's homes. Um, for me, like working in clinic, I knew that coming to the clinic regularly has all sorts of challenges for people. Um, so for me, it was really important that it could be based in their home. And I basically travel around Wales um, for three years, setting people up on the brain training, um, delivering laptops to their homes, checking in on them, checking they're okay. And we work with this organization called Happy Neuron who developed the games. Um, there's all sorts of brain training out there and we can talk a little bit more about that later. I think it might be useful. Um, but when people consented to taking part in the study, they would also get reminders to complete their brain training. So that was really um, important too. But before I go in to brain training and what that is, um, the phrase brain training is used a lot. And sometimes we mean different things or different people mean different things when they say it. So you can do brain training on a computer and that's the type of brain training that I was talking about in this study but you can also do loads of brain training with a simple pen and paper tasks. So crosswords, Sudoku, they're all types of brain training. So I wanna um, open up this invite to all of you guys watching. So if you wouldn't mind just putting in the chat, if I gave you the option of doing brain training on a computer or with pen and paper, which would you pick? So just write pen and paper or computer in the chat and we'll see um, how you get on. Um, and what the kind of audience thinks. Um, interestingly, my study was pre-COVID. Um, oh, interesting, flooding in answers. Thank you, everyone. Um, and what we found is that although it was a mixture, um, in the, the clinic, most people, it was about a 50-50 split. And some people actually declined to take part in the study because they said that they used computers too much at work. Um, and they didn't want to use computers in their kind of social time, which is absolutely fair enough. Um, I think that we're probably likely to see that even more now, right? Because we're living our whole lives online. Um, 
but yeah, thank you for taking part. Like, it looks like most of you would go computer, actually. There are some pen and papers in there as well. Um, but from my perspective in this study, we did use computer game brain training, and that gives us a lot more data, which is useful. It can be controlled better. Um, but pen and paper is an option too, and we can talk about that kind of later. Um, I wanted to give you a flavour of what the participants actually saw. So this is an example. So they had six different games to play um, over the course of the study, which was 12 weeks. And we asked them to play three 30 minute sessions a week. So at the beginning of the study, we asked people, you know, how does the three 30 minute sessions a week sound to you? Do you think that's feasible? Everybody said yes. Um, I don't know, maybe have a think about how that sounds to you, three 30 minute sessions a week. Um, this is what they saw and they could play any of these games in any order. We just asked that they completed 30 minutes of um, gameplay three times a week. So I wanted to run through one of these games with you and um, kind of live now, um, but these are screenshots, so don't worry, it'll all be fine. Um, there were different levels to the exercises. So level one is the easiest, so don't worry, all is good. Um, and then everybody got this answer, this, sorry, this phrase of they could take a look at the example or they could start straight away. Um, it was a 50-50 split actually, Lots of people just wanted to start straight away. Others preferred to take a look at the example. So let's see what um, this task is all about. This is a modified version of what we call the trail making task. And one of the really important parts for me was to give the company feedback on their instructions as well. So um, maybe you'll see, particularly in the next task, what I mean by that. But the instructions here, click all four bubbles as quickly as possible, beginning with start and ending with finish, advancing in alphabetical order. So let's do this. So we start with the letter E and then we move to the letter M and then people playing the game just clicked on the bubbles, M, N and then finish on T. So that's the first stage. Um, this is the second stage that says alternate between letters and numbers, two letters and two numbers will be displayed on the screen. Click the bubbles in alternating ascending order as quickly as possible, beginning with start and ending with finish by advancing in alphabetical and numerical order. Whew. Um, a bit of a mouthful. One of the tasks that's much easier to actually do than to say maybe or explain. Um, but this is a, a task that goes basically, yeah, exactly Alex, um, letter, number, letter, number. So starting with M and then going to a number, which is zero, the next letter N and then the final number four. So then all of our participants got this feedback on how they'd done, how accurate they were, um, how many errors they'd made and how quickly they completed the task too. And then they got a message um, either saying, you know, well done, great job, or try again, try next time. And then if they got 100% accuracy on two consecutive occasions, they advanced to the next level. And um, everybody in the study, absolutely everybody, opted for email reminders rather than any other form of reminder. So they got these emails into their inbox and you can click straight through into your brain training um, to start the workout. This is what it looked like from my perspective as, as a researcher. So I could see when the people were doing the brain training um, you can see the green as they've completed that 30 minutes that we asked them to and the different levels they'd obtained. So what do we find? So as I said earlier, this study took about three years, um, but it was a very small scale study. So we only had 30 people overall. And overall, this is um, the length of time in the study. So the beginning of the study, six weeks in and 12 weeks in. So we did see that as the study went on, some people dropped out. Um, but in the control group, so half of the people we didn't ask to do any brain training and half people we did. In the control group who weren't doing anything, everybody stayed in the study. The people who were doing the brain training, we saw some people um, did drop out. Of the people that did the brain training, um, this pie chart just shows you how they got on. So of the 13 people that did the brain training, four completed those three 30 minute sessions a week. Four others completed some, but less than what we'd asked. One person completed a little, one person didn't complete any brain training. 
um, two people were lost to follow up. So that meant that they um, kind of weren't answering correspondence and one person withdrew um, due to reasons kind of unrelated. So there was a lot of variability um, in the results. And this is one of the problems with the study in that we kind of had to conclude that because our um, participants showed such variability, it's difficult to know um, whether it, it kind of worked or not. But what we did do is asked people to complete some interviews. And I think these are really important because it gives us some ideas of, of how we can change this up and make the study kind of bigger and better. So a number of benefits were recognized. So lots of people said the brain training gave them time for themselves, um, time to kind of de-stress, something for them to do. Um, but there were some barriers, which I think are really important and really useful information. So some people wanted to play these games on their phones and, or tablets. Um, frustration was a key theme as well. But for one individual um, who signed up in, at a time during their life around a diagnosis, they said, you know, this had absolutely changed their life. Doing this brain training had proved to them that they could still do stuff and actually subsequently went on to sign up to a degree. Um, and I think that research involvement more generally is, is really interesting and can be quite key for some people. Um, this slide just reminds me to mention that, you know, brain training and lifestyle um, studies and, and doing things to kind of maintain brain health is really good. Um, but we'll never kind of get to the genetic cause um, of HD. So lifestyle factors are really important. And again, we can um, kind of talk about that, but it's, it's part of the whole package, right? So, you know, looking after your overall well-being um, as well. So um, finally, just to say thank you to everybody that took part in the, in the study, particularly the, the families um, and participants. So we literally wouldn't have been able to do it um, without them. Lots of groups who I've worked with over the years, um, both in the clinic and in the lab, and the lovely people that um, funded the research as well. So that's a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour um, through brain training and what I've been up to. Um, just say thank you, Dioch, as we say in Wales. Um, and now I'm going to break and take some questions. Awesome. Thank you very much for going over all that. Um, you know, I think it's important to kind of look at you know, this, this different perspective when we even just discuss HD. So we do have time for questions, which is awesome. So uh, one of the first questions we got was, in what way did the brain training improve the condition of the mice tested in your PhD? And did it affect the onset or lifetime? And how did you measure the effect? So several questions in the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a great question. And I think this really highlights something for me about brain training, which is brain training generally, um, when you do it as people, but also we found this in the mice, um, they get better at that task. So that attention task that I showed you, they were really good at that task. But a more relevant question, I think, is does that transfer into our lives? So yeah, I like to give the example of like number puzzles. So you could get really good at Sudoku or number puzzles, which is great. You'll probably feel a certain amount of achievement um, and fulfillment in doing that. But does it actually help you, you know, add up the shopping that you're doing, you know, adding up that bill in your head? You know, does that transfer? And we call this a transfer effect. Does that affect transfer into helping in, in daily life? Um, so in terms of the question about the mice, we showed that their attention improved. They were able to get to those um, holes that I showed you quicker and their um, motor symptoms as well did show some improvements. And we measured that by something called the rotor rod, which is a, um, a kind of a drum where the mice walk along that. Um, so, yeah, that's a great question because it hits home at that really important point of, OK, you might get really good at brain training, but does that transfer into your kind of real life? And, you know, I think the danger with brain training and the World Health Organization now recognise, you know, computer gaming can be an addiction, don't they? So, you know, playing computer games in moderation is, is probably quite key, I'd say. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I feel like it's always going to be like a, a balance, right, of, especially, I think, with, and I saw it in, in the chat with the during the pandemic, like everyone's on their 
computer the whole time too. I actually participated in a study where I did it after being on a screen all day and I felt like my brain was just like fried by the end of it. So it's, yes. it, can be, it can be tough. But um, another question was about what about those exercises as preventative? So for example, for people not having any HD symptoms yet, and are there any studies giving insight on potential effect to shift the symptoms declaration? Yeah, so I don't think there are yet. Um, and I'm going to pick up on Chris's question as well in answering this one, if that's OK, um, because, you know, you have picked up on the fact that the number of participants was small. You're absolutely right, Chris, it was. Um, but and also I should say um, in my study, we in terms of disease stage, we um, invite it, like, it was an open invite. We didn't have any criteria on that. Um, so I think in terms of um, preventative measures, I think um, it's potentially useful. Um, what I would say, and this is a very much a personal view, for me, there isn't enough evidence for anybody to pay for brain training games. You can get free brain training games online, which are great. You know, for me, there is absolutely no evidence that you should be paying for these types of um, games. So that's like a key point. Um, but yeah, I think it's that balance, as you said, Seth, you know, you could, and people do kind of just sit there and play games all day, um, but it's a balance. You know, we know that lifestyle factors, particularly at the moment when we're restricted anyway, getting out into the fresh air um, and green spaces and our well-being that way as well. So I think brain training is useful in a piece of the puzzle, right? So, you know, it's about, you know, watching what you eat and being healthy and getting exercise. You know, Seth and I were talking about, about exercise and especially in the pandemic, you know, I used, used to love playing netball. Apparently that's a very British sport. <laughs> we found Just out. Just learn about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think it's a, a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. A um, few more questions coming in. Yeah. Um, I would say the next one, how did you decide on 30 minutes three times a week? Yeah, good question, Harriet. So we decided that based on discussions with the um, provider of the games. Um, and that was one of the things that we really wanted to look at feedback wise, because everybody said that they thought that that was feasible. But actually, in terms of the results of the study, lots of people didn't manage to achieve that. Um, so actually, whether in the future we might look at shorter periods of time, but more regularly, so maybe like 10 minutes a day over five days, for example, and whether that has any impact. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think what we think is going to be fine and often, you know, oh, will this be okay? Yeah, sure. It'd be fine. And then the reality of it is sometimes maybe a bit different. Yeah, I, I will say I, I have participated in a exercise study and it was three times a week as well. So maybe that's just like the, the, the lucky number these days. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> um, someone asked if, you're able to recommend any um well I guess there's a few free brain training online or any examples for pen and paper exercises is there any good resources out there that can provide these yeah so I think um it's Claire asking that question I think you know it really depends on what appeals to you so you know some people love those number puzzles like the sudokus other people love the more kind of crosswordy word play and puzzles um so I think as long as it's free you know give it a go um and see you know what appeals to you um some are more kind of problem solving spatial orientation so I'm thinking like the Rubik's Cube do you have those in the US Is that the Rubik's yeah Cube? we do we do I was never um, good at it but oh I'm terrible at it too. Yeah. <laughs> um but you know things like Tetris as well that's like a spatial organization um game as well so, yeah, I'd, I'd have a look at, you know, what appeals to you and, and your kind of um, interests, um, but make sure they're free. Yeah. And then like any pen and paper ones that might be good as well. Yeah. So I think Sudokus, crosswords, those types of ones. Um, some people have those cryptic crosswords, which again, like I'm not good at cryptic crosswords. For me, they're like another level of crossword. Um, but yeah, I think. Pen and paper wise, lots of people find that a nice distraction, but even even things like reading a book, like a novel, there is an element of cognition involved in that, you know, 
in reading. So in terms of coming away from screens and doing stuff to help with our well-being, even just like reading a book can be so useful and such a, a de-stress. And just picking up on one of the comments about the, the feedback we had in terms of benefits and barriers, the fact that lots of people saw this as like an opportunity to take time out for them. And I mean, you can do that in all sorts of ways. You know, it doesn't have to be brain training. That could be, you know, reading a book, watching a film, taking time out for you. And in some ways, I'm a little bit kind of saddened that people had to have this reason to take time out, to like have permission to take time out for them. Um, but I think especially at the moment, that's so important to take care of ourselves and to take time out to, to look after ourselves. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was one of those people who I feel like because of the pandemic, I learned the importance of self-care and taking time out of each day. So I couldn't agree more. Um, as we kind of wrap up any other final thoughts or takeaways that you want to leave with our audience? So I think um, for me, there's loads of research going on, isn't there, in, in HD? And I think as um, potential participants, don't be afraid to like talk to researchers, you know, quiz us, ask us questions, you know, um, I want to take part in this study, but I've got these questions. That's absolutely fine. And I think in terms of this study, we saw some people um, kind of not engaging with the brain training games, and we have some um, reasons for that, which are really interesting. Um, but please don't be afraid to talk to us. I think sometimes people think like scientists and doctors and, and people are, you know, kind of a bit academic or maybe like won't get it, not on their level. Please do ask us. Um, most people are lovely, I promise. Um, but yeah, in terms of research, you know, it's really important that you do have your questions answered. So don't be afraid. There genuinely isn't a silly question ever. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to, to ask. Awesome. Yes, researchers don't bite, right? I promise. <laughs> well, I haven't known any two yet anyway. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that's a great way to, to wrap it up. And again, thank you. Thank you for this insightful talk and for answering these, these questions as well. Um, something... I, I, have, I always feel like I learned something new, even, even in just these talks and just reminders as well of, of self-care and, and taking that time for myself. Um, but this was great. And, you know, next up we have uh, on you, everyone gets the option, right? Track one, we have someone speaking about their experience growing up in Pakistan with an HD family and in track two, um, we have another speaker who will be talking about the biology of juvenile Huntington's disease. So you get the pick which one you'd like to go to. And I hope everyone has a good uh, rest of their day or session, but I will, I'm sure, see some people again soon. So thanks again, Dr. Wynell. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's so nice. And thank you for organizing this Congress. It's so awesome. Of course. Take care, everyone.